So this is our Tulane University pre-arrival webinar focusing on off-campus housing. This webinar aims to educate you on what to consider when moving to Orleans to attend Tulane University. Our panelists will cover a variety of topics, including um, how to locate off-campus housing, things to consider before you do sign a lease, safety and security measures that you should consider and take, um, how to set up your utilities, um, transportation around the city, emergency preparedness, and being a good neighbor. I'd like to have each of our presenters introduce themselves. I just realized I didn't do that. So my name is Katherine Tyner. I'm the Assistant Dean of Student, um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Anthony. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Captain Anthony Dominguez, and I work for the Tulane University Police Department. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Deputy Chief uh, Jared Sullivan. I work for the uh, Tulane University Police Department as well. I'm the Deputy Chief of the Support Service Division, which includes our uh, community policing, which uh, covers a lot of the stuff we're going to be talking about today, particularly the uh, services that will be available to you in our community. And as you uh, either uh, continue or begin your journey here at Tulane. I think uh, next we have Mr. Uh, Justin Reed with us as well. Hey, greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Reed. I'm the International Student Engagement Manager with the Office of International Students and Scholars. With that, I'll pass it to Jennifer. Hi, y'all. I'm Jennifer O'Brien Brown. I'm the Assistant Director of the Office of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies. I work primarily with our PhD students, research based masters, and postdoctoral fellows. Next up is Gregory Nichols. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Greg Nichols, and I am uh, an attorney here in New Orleans, and uh, I act as the, uh, the supervising attorney for the civil section of the Tulane Legal Assistance Program, and I'll be talking a little bit about today, a little today about Louisiana landlord-tenant law and your rights and uh, finding a, 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 a good situation for you as far as your leasing concerns are in Louisiana. And next is, uh, next is Donald Veals. Hey, good evening, everyone. My name is Donald Bills. I'm the Assistant Director of Emergency Preparedness and Response for Tulane University. It is our department's job to ensure that Tulane is prepared for any type of emergency that may occur on any of our campuses. And today I'll be talking to you about hurricane preparedness. And I'll pass it over to um, Chris Zakarta. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Zakarta, the Director of Student Conduct. Uh, my office is responsible for the adjudication of student behavior as is defined by the Code of Student Conduct. Great. So I'm going to kick off and talk about a few different um, off-campus housing options we have. The first, and this is a map of some zip codes um, near our uptown campus and downtown campus. The first option we're really excited to talk about is this year we launched an off-campus housing website specific to Tulane University. Um, it's offcampushousing.tulane.edu. And this is a robust site. It will allow you to do a map-based housing search based on whichever campus um, you'll primarily be based at. Uh, it also offers an option to find roommates, set up a roommate profile. It offers sublet options and a lot of good um, renter need to know resources. So as you go to this website in the upper right hand corner where it says sign in or sign up, you're going to sign in and be brought to this page. On the left hand side, you'll click on students, faculty and staff sign in with your TU SSO credentials. That's your username and password that you use for your Tulane email account and your Gibson account. Once you sign in, you can set up your profile. Um, you can do a housing search. You can add a roommate profile. You can do a roommate search. So you'll see here, this is from a week ago. We had 22 roommates that were looking for people to live with. Um, and it will say, you know, if they want to live near the uptown campus or the downtown campus, you can um, 
sort, you can narrow and filter your search by um, a variety of different options. And then when you're doing your housing search, you can also search by a variety of different options. So you can search by Uptown Campus, oops, Downtown Campus, um, or Elmwood Campus, and it gives you housing within a three mile radius of each of those campuses. You can also search by neighborhood location. You can filter it even more to say you wanna live by public transportation, groceries, shopping, fitness. Um, there's a whole list of, of filters to use. You can do, you can say you wanna move in during the month of August and it's gonna show you the properties that will be available then, um, a move in range, move in now or anytime different options for lease information, um, short-term lease, month-to-month, 12-month -month lease, et cetera, um, transportation, features of the, the unit, community features, et cetera. You can then go to the, um, this is where you'll find the knowledge base. And so it's set up by find, lease, move, and live. So if you go and find, we have some really cool um, PDF documents that you can use. So there's a budget worksheet, there's things to consider when looking for roommates, there's things to consider when searching for apartments, um, there's our off-campus living guide, there's tooling resources. Under lease, we again have some things about um, roommates and, and student budget, but also suggested questions to ask potential landlords, a sample roommate or housemate agreement, um, and a variety of different resources. Under MOVE, we have some keys to successful off-campus living, as well as this list of emergent uh, New Orleans resources. So if you click on New Orleans Police Department, it's gonna take you to their website, if you click on Entergy, which is in Orleans Parish, our um, uh, utilities um, provider for electricity, it'll bring you to their website. And then live again, a few different resources that you can use um, <clears throat> once you've you know, started your housing search or moved in. We also offer Deming Pavilion. So this is our downtown graduate housing. Um, it's located in the medical district on Tulane's downtown campus. It's furnished um, studio one and two bedroom apartments. To apply for Deming, you go to the Housing and Residence Life website under housing logistics and you'll click on the upper right-hand corner housing portal. And so that takes you to your housing portal where you can apply for any Tulane um, housing, including Deming Pavilion. So again, you visit your housing portal, you're gonna log in with your Tulane credentials, you'll select Tulane graduate housing and click apply, and then complete the steps of that housing application and electronically sign the contract. Another downtown option is 1315. This is a new um, apartment building in downtown New Orleans uh, located near our School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine and School of Social Work, as well as the med school. This is a partnership with Tulane. Um, so this isn't Tulane housing per se, but it's geared towards Tulane students. So if this is something you're interested in, you would just go to their website, um, 1315, and you can view their floor plans, you can schedule a tour, you can contact them to apply. And the last one is the residences at LSU. Um, the LSU, which is Louisiana State University, their health campus 
um, just opened this new residence, it's apartments, and they've offered, they've extended to our Tulane students that Tulane students are able to apply to live there as well. Um, this is another brand new building. It is in the downtown medical district neighborhood on our downtown campus. You can look at their floor plans, the different amenities, and you can apply online. After each section, we're gonna have some resources. So once we upload the PowerPoint to our website, all of these different resources will live in that PowerPoint. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Anthony and Jared to discuss safety and security. Uh, good afternoon again. Uh, so I'm here to talk a little bit about safety and security off campus and how to keep your safe, uh, yourself safe. And then a little bit about our police department. Um, Tulane University does have its own police department. Um, we are a full, uh, fully accredited police department. Uh, all of our officers have full arrest authority in the state of Louisiana. Um, we are also CALEA certified, which is the Commission on the Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies. Um, that just kind of means we follow best practices, um, including, you know, just different standards and our policies and whatnot. Um, we work collaboratively with uh, the New Orleans Police Department, um, and we enforce laws off campus and on, on campus. Um, we actually patrol, our patrol jurisdiction is granted to us by an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding with the City of New Orleans, where we patrol about a mile in every direction off campus. Um, for Uptown, our border streets are Claiborne to St. Charles and then Jefferson Avenue to um, Carrollton Avenue, South Carrollton. And then downtown, uh, we also patrol off campus with that MOU. And those boundaries are South Claiborne to Loyola and then Poydras to Canal. Uh, downtown's a little more different. Uh, downtown has kind of buildings scattered in, in different places with some, um, some business areas in between. So uh, our, our patrol area kind of encompasses that entire, that entire space. Um, Tulane police officers patrol on and off campus 24 hours a day, um, seven days a week. Uh, we don't take breaks, uh, we don't take holidays, so we're always around. Um, when you sign a lease with your landlord, something that one of the services we offer is um, security assessments. And that's, um, that's done by uh, myself. I think we lost Anthony. Maybe he ran out to do a security assessment. Um, uh, so let me pick up a little bit. So as Anthony was talking about, we do offer a safety and security assessment. Uh, what this is, is this is an opportunity to, before you uh, sign a lease, to have a two-lane police officer come out to your uh, property and we'll take a look at it and we'll let you know some things to consider, uh, maybe some options that you can bring to your landlord that uh, they may want to address before you actually sign that lease. And we, we, we do this through a concept called CEPTED, C-P-T-E-D, which is crime prevention through environmental design. So it's not just somebody coming out there, you know, with some good ideas saying, hey, maybe there should be uh, better locks. These are actually uh, national standards that we've sent uh, officers like Anthony to a school to learn. So you're getting uh, best practices that are brought through um, uh, many different agencies. Sorry about that. I had a Wi-Fi crashed on me. <laughs> so. Um... But yeah, the, um, I told him you you were out doing a, a, a security assessment. <laughs> a I, uh, no, unfortunately, New Orleans Wi-Fi, right? Um, so when anyway, uh, like, you talk about security assessments and SEPTED, and you can uh, maybe jump on here. Sure, sure. Um, so for um, before you sign a lease, obviously, um, you want to inspect the residence, right? Um, ask for a walkthrough. Um, make sure you conduct a walkthrough, especially if um, if you're going to be leasing a, a house. Um, ask for um, the safety equipment, check out the fire safety, see if there's any cameras um, located on the building, any floodlights on the exterior. Um, per New Orleans uh, municipal ordinances, all residences have to have some sort of operational fire detection system, an alarm. Um, so make sure that you know, the residence has one. It can be either battery powered, you know, just like the plain ones that are on the wall, those work great. And then also you kind of want to make sure that there's a CO2 monitor somewhere. If not, you can buy one for relatively cheap. Um, the NOFD does offer 
um, smoke alarms. Um, so if your uh, residence that you have or that you're going into doesn't have any, um, you can get with NOFD, um, the New Orleans Fire Department, and they actually give you two. Um, they'll set up two for you. You can go down to the station and pick them up. Um, you can actually also ask for installation. Um, the Uptown Campus uh, sits in the 6th District of NOFD, um, and then the Downtown Campus sits in the 2nd District. And you can find that on the resources section, our phone numbers for them. Um, for security, um, the New Orleans Police Department, as well as Tulane University Police Department, we published our, our statistics for crime on our website, I know PD does it on their website, but we actually have it on our crime map as well, which is that that website on there, tulane.it slash NOPD. Um, you can see all the stats. Uh, we update our daily crime log uh, daily, uh, every business day, um, with all the stats that are uh, for cr crime that's reported to us. Uh, for uh, NOPD, our uptown campus sits in the second district of uh, the New Orleans Police Department and our downtown district, um, our downtown area, I'm sorry, campus sits in the 8th district. Um, you know, a good way to get with uh, or to find out more about uh, your location and your landlord is you can meet with your neighbors, uh, talk to talk to the uh, neighbors or other two line students that may have rented um, from that landlord. Um, also, is the property well maintained? Um, you don't want uh, large bushes on the exterior covering windows or covering access. Um, that's places where people can hide and that's something you don't want. Um, and then also, of course, if it's well maintained, the exterior, then, you know, you probably may have a good landlord who takes care of their property and uh, they're not just trying to get another two lane student in. Um, I know Deputy Chief already touched on the security assessments. So uh, you can call us at any time. We'd be more than happy to come check out your, uh, your, your residence. Um, Here's some some good safety tips um, for street survival uh, in the city of New Orleans, and these are just you can take these anywhere really. Um, avoid walking alone at night. Um, always walk with friends. Walk in a group. Um, Tulane Police Department offers escorts, um, so if you need to get anywhere uh, close by campus in that patrol jurisdiction that I told you about, uh, we'd be more than happy to pick you up, give you a ride. If it's somewhere on campus, uh, we can have officers walk with you. Um, we do that for free. It's no bother. Our officers love to get out there uh, with the community. Uh, we also offer through two lane shuttles and transportation tap ride, which is like two lanes version of uh, Uber. Um, that can be found on the shuttles website. Um, the application is like any app on your phone. It's through the iOS store or Google Play. And there's a map. You can tell the shuttle where you are. It'll drive. It'll come pick you up. You have a GPS unit on it, so you can see how long it's going to take to get to you. And it'll go anywhere in the gold zone map. Uh, which is uh, reflected on the website. Uh, like I said, TUPD escorts are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. All you have to do is call us. We'll be more than happy to help you out. The only thing I ask is that we're not going to pick you up at your house and drop you off at a bar. Um, we don't do that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, if you are if you need a safety escort, we'll be more than happy to take care of you. Um, when you're walking around, always be alert and be aware of your surroundings. Um, I know we... I always have our faces in our phones or earbuds in, but um, I walk around with one in. I don't put both in, just so I'm aware of what's going on around me. I can kind of pay attention to who's by me and who's walking. Um, I, you know, stay in well lit areas. Uh, if you if you're downtown and uh, you're trying to get back to your residence um, or you're on Bourbon Street, um, you know, stay on the well lit streets. Don't turn down those alleyways. Um, if it's a shortcut, if your if your Google Maps says, "Hey, this is going to get you faster," but you're looking down that street and it's relatively dark and there's not really a whole lot of people, stay off that street. Take five more minutes and walk down those crowded areas. Um, if you're being harassed by uh, by anybody in the street, uh, try to draw uh, attention to yourself. Um, try to you know make some noise so people come to you. Um, always carry a state ID with you. Um, at Tulane, it is required that you always possess your splash ID with you. That's so we can make sure that, you know, you belong on campus. And that also grants you access to buildings on campus. Um, always trust your instincts. If, that, if your gut's telling you, hey, this is not a good situation or someone makes you feel uneasy, avoid that situation, avoid that person and leave the area. For safety tips for your home, home safety. Um, Always lock your doors. Um, 
I know uh, some of our students come from very small communities or everybody knows your name, uh, everybody's friendly, um, but um, this is a big city, New Orleans is a, is a big city. Uh, so you always have to make sure you lock your doors. Um, as soon as you get home, lock your door behind you. Um, even if you have to come in for a few minutes and then go back out, just it's better safety uh, precaution to lock your doors. Um, if you have any concerns about the safety of your residence, uh, like a window's uh, jammed, um, a screen is off, uh, something like that that just kind of seems off, uh, contact your landlord immediately. Let them know, hey, look, you know, I, I, I think this is an issue um, and I, I'd like you to fix it. Um, in Louisiana, landlords are required to provide effective locks for residences. So if you're looking at a house and it doesn't have a good lock, it's just one of those little, you know, sliding locks on the knob. Um, you know, talk to your landlord about installing something, another feature. Um, always leave your windows locked. It's not a good habit, not only because we have large bugs that like to fly in through windows at night. Uh, don't leave your windows open during the night. Um, some, some of our students come from areas where you can do that. Um, but, you know, it, uh, it's not a good practice to leave your windows uh, open or, or unlocked for that matter. Uh, leave an exterior light on. Uh, that's just good habit. Um, it kind of shows people either that you're home or it also prevents someone from hiding in the dark outside of your residence when you come out. Um, because a lot of times the first thing we do when we step out of a door is we turn around to lock it. Um, when you have the light on, when you step out of your front door, you have you know full vision of what's going on outside. Um, never, never, never allow strangers into your home. Um, if it's someone that says they're a salesman, ask for identification. Um, they have to carry some sort of ID to show who they are. Um, but don't allow someone into your home, if it's somebody passing by and they say, hey, can I get a cup of water? Um, you know, if you want to give them a cup of water, they can stay outside. You can go inside, lock the door behind you and get the water. But if a situation feels unsafe, um, you know, like I said, trust your instincts, right? Keep all valuables. Um, if you have um, cash, important documents like birth certificates, passports, um, visas or whatnot, uh, they sell these very nice fireproof or waterproof um, safes or lock boxes. Uh, you can stick all your documents in there. You can keep it secured. And then it's actually a really handy way to keep everything in one place. So I know Donald's going to talk about it for hurricane preparedness, but if you have to go, you have to get out. It's a quick way to just grab your box and head out. Uh, you don't have to go searching for your visa. Oh, where's my passport? Where's my visa? Uh, where's all my cash? Uh, everything's right there, uh, ready to rock and roll. Um, so like the slide says, plan to take your safe box, uh, your safe or your lockbox with you uh, if you need to evacuate. Um, we have a, uh, a partnership with a, web, a website called Leads Online. Um, the program is called Report It. Um, you can keep track of all your serial numbers for all of your products. So every electronic in your home, your bicycle, your cell phone, they all have a serial number. You can use this website, this program to, uh, to keep track of all those serial numbers in the event anything's stolen. Um, purchase a lock for your laptop, even if it's at home. Uh, it's a good good plan to just have one of those locks that loop through the back. It locks up to your desk um, and no one can take it off, off your desk. Um, again, like we talked about earlier, uh, walk around the exterior of the residence, see if there's any cameras, uh, if there's floodlights, uh, just make sure they're in working order, right? Um, if you see a camera, ask your landlord if it actually works and who has access to that, right? Um, do you have access to that? Does the landlord or is it a dummy camera? Um, that's all really important information for you to know prior to signing any sort of lease. Um, excuse me, that's my ring camera. Um, if you come home and there's an open door, your front door is open, you see a window broken, do not go into your house, uh, go back into your car. Uh, and call 911 or call Tulane Police. Um, let us uh, do a search of the home to make sure there's nobody sitting in the house uh, or someone had broken into your home. And these are some uh, good resources. Uh, our website, uh, the next one is about the Everbridge app, but I believe Donald's gonna talk about that. The Walk the Waveway um, website or link is just a map of our patrol area and good corridors that we recommend students walk if you're walking around campus. And then the bottom one is NOPD's website where you can find more information about um, the crime stats. So appreciate your time. Thank you.
Thanks, Anthony. Next, I'm going to turn it over to Justin Reed. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Justin. Um, Jennifer and I are going to go over some other things that you should uh, should consider before you actually go about reviewing and signing a lease. Um, so before you sign a lease, uh, like TUPD had mentioned, you might want to end up touring the property. Or let's say if you arrive in the city uh, before you found housing or before you can actually officially move into your residence, uh, you might want to make use of some of the temporary housing resources that are available in New Orleans. There are various hostels across New Orleans that offer cheap temporary housing. Uh, there are also Airbnb or a Verbo that you can make use of. Uh, that are good uh, temporary housing solutions. Uh, and there are also different uh, hotels across the city as well. Uh, many of them also do offer discounts to Tulane affiliates. Uh, we have a full list of these resources available on our website. A lot of our international students use these, but of course, uh, anyone is more than welcome to use these uh, temporary housing resources. Next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, location, location, location is very important when you are considering where you might want to live. Uh, and there are a few different things that you should keep in mind with regard to uh, location. Uh, first, uh, it's important to consider uh, how far you are from campus and how, you know, how you're going to actually get physically to campus. And Jennifer is going to talk more later about uh, transportation options to and from campus. But uh, if you plan on walking, it's important to evaluate how far that walk might actually be. While uh, 20 minutes might not sound like a very far walk, uh, doing that walk during a 95 degree heat during the summer and fall or during a rainstorm might be very difficult. Uh, so don't underestimate how far a few blocks might be from campus. Um, if you plan to live near the Uptown campus, uh, you might wanna consider living inside the gold zone uh, so you can utilize TapRide that TPD had mentioned. And Jennifer's going to talk a little bit more about TapRide later as well when she talks about uh, transportation. Uh, but TapRide, again, it's a free service available uh, to Tulane affiliates if you live within the, uh, within the gold zone. Um, before you go about uh, signing a lease as well, uh, you might want to also, you know, take a look at the condition of the neighborhood. Uh, take a walk around the neighborhood if you can. Um, like TP, I mentioned, you might want to ask yourself, does the house look well maintained? You know, tour the property, take a look. Um, can you imagine yourself living uh, in that house uh, during your time here at Tulane? If you can't physically walk around the neighborhood, uh, take a look at Google Street View and use that to get a good idea of what the neighborhood looks like. Uh, each neighborhood has some distinct characteristics, and uh, Jennifer is going to now talk a little bit about. Uh, some of the different um, housing types available in New Orleans. Yeah, thank you, Justin. As we were talking in advance, we realized that uh, there might be some things about our housing market that you're not familiar with. Um, so while there are a few complexes, apartment complexes, like what Catherine mentioned in the Lower Garden District and Mid-City and Downtown, um, most units in Uptown near the Uptown campus are a part of small buildings typically, um, and they're often owned and managed by an individual or a family. It's fairly common to find shotgun doubles, which are a type of small duplex where the owner often lives on one side and renters are on the other side. So that can have, oh, hold on. Could we go back just a sec? <laughs> Thanks. Um, so it's, a, uh, you know, it can have a lot of advantages with you know, potentially having your landlord living very close um, that they perhaps can fix things quickly. Uh, but it also means that there aren't always a lot of landlords who can tell you many months in advance that they'll probably have five units vacant when you're moving to town. Um, and it also means that the type of property that you tend to, that you often find, especially in Uptown, tends to be more like a house, less like an apartment. With that, I'll give it back to Justin. Still muted. Uh, so yeah, as Jennifer had uh, just mentioned, yeah, like each neighborhood does have kind of distinct characteristics. Um, if you want to check out this uh, website, for example, um, it's a really great way to learn about the different neighborhoods that are in the city. Uh, this map here is provided by NewOrleans.com. Uh, it certainly doesn't showcase every single neighborhood in the city, uh, but it's a great place maybe to start your search. 
Uh, you can read about things, uh, different things to do in each neighborhood, different activities and more. Again, not all neighborhoods are featured on this map. Uh, most of the ones listed here are all in Orleans Parish. There are some locations like Jefferson Parish or St. Bernard Parish that might be good options in terms of uh, housing too. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, talking about what's in the neighborhood. So before you actually sign a lease, it might be a good idea to look at Google Maps and see what's nearby uh, your potential future residence. If you don't plan on driving in New Orleans, you might wanna take a look to see if there are any grocery stores or markets close to your property. If you have uh, prescriptions or you, know, you might need to utilize a pharmacy, you might wanna see if that's something that's also close by as well. Uh, in addition to these services, you might wanna see what sort of fun or recreational activities are in your area as well. If you're someone that likes to eat and try different restaurants, you might wanna live somewhere close where you can easily get to uh, different restaurants to try new food. Uh, if you're physically active and enjoy spending time outdoors, you might wanna try and live close by to a park. Uh, however, there are some things to be uh, wary of as well. If you're someone who enjoys uh, going, oh, sorry, can you go back real quick? Yeah, thank you. Uh, if you're you know, someone that enjoys uh, going to bed early and you want kind of a quiet neighborhood, Living next to a bar or a music venue might not be the best idea. Gasa Gasa, which is pictured here, it's a very fun music venue uh, that's located near the Uptown campus. However, they might not be the best neighbor if they're hosting a rock concert and, for example, you have an exam the next day. So again, utilizing Google Maps, uh, it's a great resource to see kind of what's in your neighborhood, what might be uh, near your potential future property. Yeah, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, before signing, uh, it's important to evaluate uh, what's included in the property. Are utilities included, or is it something that you might have to pay separately? Uh, this may affect your budget uh, as you're you know, looking for housing. And Jennifer is going to talk about both of these topics in a little bit, uh, but this is something, oh, yeah, sorry, go back. Uh, this is something to uh, consider as you're you know, browsing what's available. Another thing to consider is if there's any amenities included in the property, such as in-unit laundry. Uh, most units will have their own washer and dryer, but not all of them do. If laundry is not inside your unit, um, you know, you might share it with other tenants in your building potentially, or there might just not be laundry on site. Uh, and if that's the case, you might need to see, is there a laundromat nearby that I can easily uh, get to to do my laundry? And there's, you can always review the listing or ask the landlord uh, to see what amenities are um, included in a property before you sign a lease. Next slide, please. Yes, so it rains a lot in New Orleans. So make sure you make use of the uh, City of New Orleans resources uh, to check that there is a risk of flood to the property before signing a lease. Uh, you can visit this city website and type in the address uh, to get a reading of the flood risk for the property and see if there has been any uh, previously reported flood damage. Uh, most properties in New Orleans are elevated but some are at risk of flooding for a variety of factors. And uh, Jennifer is now going to talk a little bit about uh, some of her own experiences with flooding. Well, not, not too many of the horror stories, but um, as Justin was saying, it's a good idea to look on Google. Um, my, my home, we checked it out on this website. We are in a flood zone, but because my home is raised like so many homes in New Orleans, about four feet off the ground, as have been every residents I've had in the city um, that has not actually impacted us too much. So um, yeah, at this point, uh, next slide, please. Um, so this webinar, how much rent can I afford? This webinar is going out to students in a wide variety of circumstances. So some of you watching either currently or in the future, maybe undergraduates preparing to move off campus for the first time. You may be an incoming graduate or professional student who's moving to New Orleans. Um, some people may be postdoctoral fellows who are starting their career. And so we know that people will be funding their studies with student loans and savings. Some will be funding with student loans and savings, while others may have stipends or jobs that underwrite their living expenses. Uh, some of you are probably using a combination of loans and employments. Um, and I do want to plug the um, budget worksheet that Catherine mentioned. 
uh, from the off-campus housing website. Um, it can be very helpful, especially if you have both loans and, or savings and employment. Um, but anyways, I'm going to talk um, about things that can work for both groups of people, but there are inherently some differences to how you'll man approach managing your money. And a lot of what I'm going to present is informational so that you have a sense of what is normal in our market since this will be used in different ways and it gets into personal finance, which is ultimately very personal. Uh, next slide. Um, so starting with people who are using student loans and savings, rules of thumb about spending on wants versus needs may not be very helpful when you're trying to just stretch limited funds as far as they will go. So the easiest approach um, is to compile a list of how much you have in savings or loans and divide it by the number of months that it needs to last. Once you know that number, we advise you to track your spending to make sure that you're staying on budget. Finally, if you are using student loans for living expenses, which is legitimate, um, be mindful that there are certain expenses that student loans may not be used for. There's a good list um, and other resources available on nerdwallet.com if you want to make sure that you're using your funds for eligible expenses. Um, also, as a note, um, I entirely messed up Catherine's plan of having resources at the end of each section. So mine are either embedded in the slide or in the comment section, but there are links everywhere. Um, <laughs> for the next group of people, um, students who receive a stipend, such as PhD students or who have employment can approach their budget differently. A standard rule of thumb is to spend approximately 50% of your income on needs, 30% on wants and 20% on savings. If you're only working part-time or at a low salary, that ratio might not work, but it is a good starting point. Um, there are a lot of great resources for budgeting when you receive a stipend. I particularly recommend looking into the work that's been done by Dr. Emily Roberts on personal finance for PhDs. Next slide. So things to consider. The list here is meant to help jog your thought process. Some things like pet expenses may not apply to you, but it can help you figure out what you need, do need to budget for. Um, so you have rent and utilities and groceries. Make sure you include insurance when you're thinking about transportation. Louisiana has some of the highest automobile insurance rates in the nation. So ask your insurance company for more information. Conversely, renter's insurance is pretty affordable and that can help you bounce back from any losses you might experience. Um, and as you're setting up your home here in New Orleans, we advise you to get creative. Tulane and New Orleans have a number of resources if you um, are looking at secondhand products, uh, goods and furnishings. There's Tulane Classifieds on Facebook and Trash to Treasure, which are both Tulane specific resources. And many neighborhoods in New Orleans have active buy nothing groups on Facebook, which is a place where neighbors can share their surpluses. Uh, next slide, please. So as I said earlier, this webinar is going out to a lot of people who will have very different financial situations. And this section is meant to simply give you an idea of what rents tend to be so that you can hopefully form a better budget in advance. Overall, average rent here in New Orleans is approximately $1,333 per month, but that does represent a compilation of all sizes of apartment from studio to three bedroom. Uh, next slide, please. So the average citywide is between 1400 and 1800 per month for a two bedroom apartment. This data shows 1800, but we've also seen 1400 listed in various places. And I don't think either number is out of line. This number is from a three month average. Um, so that could be impacted by any number of things. As you can see, um, rents are a bit cheaper in Metairie versus New Orleans on average, but uh, please bear in mind there is less public transportation in Metairie, so you will probably need a car if you're looking out that way. Some of the neighborhoods are very walkable, but it does tend to be less dense than the city. Um, 
wherever you choose to live, your best options for cost, uh, if that is something you need to be mindful of, definitely involve having roommates. And a lot of the rental market near the university is comprised of two and three bedroom apartments. And with that, I think I have teed up Justin. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, so yeah, with roommates, uh, there's many different resources that you can utilize in order to find roommates. You can always check with your admitting department to see if they have a group chat or an email list of incoming students that you can connect with. Uh, for example, our office, the Office of International Students and Scholars, we have an online orientation where incoming students can connect with each other to find housing. Uh, other departments might have something similar. Uh, you can also use the off-campus housing portal roommate finder that was talked about earlier um, in order to connect with other Tulane affiliates who might be looking for housing. And uh, another great option is the uh, Tulane Classifieds Facebook page. Uh, people will often post here if they're looking for a roommate, what their budget might be. Um, so that might be a really great way to also uh, connect with potential roommates. Next slide, please. So if you plan to live off campus uh, with other people, it is important to spend some time uh, to determine what is important to you about sharing a space. Uh, you should consider things like temperament and reliability uh, in terms of finding another roommate. If you can, uh, meet with them before in order to assess your uh, compatibility of living with each other. If you can meet in person, that's great. If not, maybe do a Zoom or Skype call in order to have a discussion about your wants and needs for sharing a living space. Uh, next slide, please. So here are some things to consider uh, before moving in with other people. Uh, first, do your temperaments match? Uh, is your potential housemate uh, very outgoing and you're more introverted? This is you know, something you might want to consider uh, as you're talking with potential people to live with. Um, you might also want to think about, uh, how, do you have the same schedule or your schedule is different? For example, if you're a student and your housemate is a bartender, you might not be operating on the same schedule and that could be a potential cause of conflict. Also, you might want to assess the reliability of your potential housemate. Uh, do they seem like a responsible person? Uh, that will pay their rent and utilities on time. As Jennifer mentioned, uh, people come from different financial backgrounds. So this can be a harder conversation to have with a potential housemate, but is definitely something that you might wanna consider uh, before signing a lease with somebody. Next slide, please. Uh, you might also wanna consider the cleanliness habits of a potential housemate as well. Are they someone that wants to vacuum every day, every week? every month, there can be tension with uh, having a shared space with someone who is both very neat and someone who is very dirty. Uh, so this is definitely something that you wanna talk with uh, your roommate about and potential housemates about before signing a lease. Also, do they have good communication skills? If there is an issue with your shared space, are they going to talk with you about it and address it with you, or are they gonna let it fester and get worse? Uh, again, that's something you might want to uh, talk with them about before you end up signing a lease. And again, having a shared interest is uh, great as well uh, in terms of finding a potential housemate. Your housemate doesn't need to be your best friend, but they could absolutely end up becoming one. Um, maybe both you and your housemate uh, both like concerts, or maybe and you both like to go out together, or maybe you both prefer to just stay in and watch movies. Uh, so it's important also to talk about uh, some potential shared interests that you might have as well. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tulap to talk about actually signing a lease. All right, hi everybody, how you doing? Uh, so um, I, I, as I mentioned, I'm, uh, I'm the uh, attorney for the civil section of the Tulane Legal Assistance Program. Uh, I've been doing it for over 20 years. Uh, we get a lot of landlord tenant issues. And so I'm going to be providing you a perspective today, sort of on the back end, uh, to a certain extent about, uh, you know, what goes wrong with a lease in New Orleans and the New Orleans area and uh, the best ways to avoid that. Um, so this is, the slide you're seeing now is basically just a, a description of TULAP and the services offered. Um, I think we can move on from that if anybody wants to contact TULAP. Uh, that's, that's the information how to do it. Okay, so before you sign a lease, uh, obviously a couple of people have mentioned if you're an international student or even if you're just coming from out of state, it might 
it might be difficult to actually uh, inspect the property itself before you arrive. Uh, there have been some good suggestions about how uh, how you can do that. I, I think you know that definitely coming down early uh, to take a look around is a good idea. When I went to Tulane, I did it, and it was a very valuable experience. Uh, but if that's not possible for you, there are are, are other options. Um, you know, one option you can have is that if you know you know who your landlord is going to be, if you know the name of their company or the name of the landlord, Google them, find out if there's. Uh, you know, there are certain landlords uh, in this city who are notorious uh, and who are, uh, you know, we'd, you'd call colloquially, colloquially uh, scum lord, slum, slum lords. Uh, <laughs> that was a Freudian slip, I guess. Uh, and uh, so those people are, you know, people leave reviews, you know, and they love to make bad reviews. And so if you're in negotiations with a landlord who's particularly troublesome, uh, Googling them before you sign a lease with them is a uh, is a pretty good way to find out. I'd recommend that uh, even if you do get to take a look at the apartment itself, it's always a good idea to, idea to do that. Um, another suggestion is that um, if you are here uh, and uh, you are able to visit the apartment, uh, and you know obviously if there's people living there already, you know you go by the apartment and you notice that it's occupied, uh, you feel free to go and knock on the door and talk to the people inside and see what it's like running from that person. Can we can we go back uh, one second? I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Thank you. Oh, uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, so th what the other things you want to know, obviously, is how long uh, is the lease term? Now, if you're an undergraduate moving from living on campus to your first off-campus housing, you very well may want to live in the apartment for a year or two years or longer. Um, leases, written leases, are typically one year. Uh, you know, just automatically. Uh, if you're an international student, though, just here for a semester, perhaps, or, you know, just a, an academic year like August to, you know, April or May, uh, a one-year term may not be right for you. Um, so it's important to not, to recognize that if, if you're signing a lease and the lease says it's, the, it's for a term of one year, uh, that, that's, that's a contract, right? And so there might be ways to get out of it, but the best way to get out of that situation is to do it at the front end. So rather than uh, immediately jumping into a full one-year lease, assuming that you don't have other options, uh, another option might be just to uh, see if you can you know, check the Tulane classified, see if there's anybody looking to sublet. Uh, Tulane is a school that's got a lot of international connections and you have a lot of people from Tulane who are gonna be studying abroad and there might be a spot open or they're, you know, for various reasons. Uh, you might be able to find something that's available for one or two semesters where you won't be locked into a full year. Um, another question you want to ask yourself is, uh, you know, I mean, the security, you're, you're going to know what the security deposit is because the landlord is absolutely going to insist on collecting that from you uh, at the moment you sign the lease, and he's not going to let you have the keys until you do. Uh, but uh, there will be portions of the security deposit that are refundable and portions that may not be. For example, it's pretty common if you have pets that a, a pet deposit will be non-refundable. That is legal. Um, generally, a security deposit is, is your property, but if there are contractual deductions from the deposit or if there is a non-refundable portion of the deposit, uh, make sure you know that before you sign. Um, the monthly rent also, you're probably going to know what that is. The landlord, again, is going to insist on the first months at the time you sign the lease, but you got to know what's included in it. Um, so if you know that can knock your bill up quite a bit if it's just the rent and you have to out-of-pocket utilities uh, Especially, you know, sewage and water in the city can be, you know, just notoriously mercurial. So, uh, you 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 want to know if you're going to be having a, a water bill that you're going to have to pay every month and a cable bill that you're going to have to be paying every month on top of your rent. Uh, chances are, most apartments it's just going to be base rent. The the um, the the extras utilities are not going to be part of it. Um, you know, rent is going to be typically due on the first of the month. Uh, it's, it's, you know, important to make sure that you have it before the period when it's de declared delinquent in the lease. Uh, usually it'll be like the 5th or the 10th or something like that, but you might find if you let that slip a little bit, you get a, you get a five-day notice to vacate posted on your door. So you don't want to find yourself there. You want to make sure that you know uh, exactly when, uh, you know, when that rent is paid and it's paid on time to the extent you can do so. Uh, it, uh, there, there uh, is not generally 24-7 maintenance in, this, uh, in the city, uh, except for emergency issues. If you do have an emergency, uh, it's, we'll go into it a little bit in, in a little bit, but notifying your landlord or the property manager in writing uh, as soon as you notice it, for example, a, a, a flooding toilet or uh, an electrical issue. 
is critically important. Uh, and I say in writing because you want to maintain that you have proof just in case the landlord is doesn't see it or doesn't seem to care uh, about the issue that you have proof that you notified him because that can come back on you. Okay, next slide, please. All right. Uh, you want to, uh, again, this is about reading the lease before you sign it. Um, you want to know, you know, usually the landlord, the, it, there may or may not be provisions in the lease about this, but, you know, if everybody's got TVs that you can hang on the wall now. Even if your lease doesn't say anything about that, don't do it. Um, you know, just get a stand because you can expect that, you know, if you're drilling into the studs, uh, you're either going to have to know how to patch that up when you move out, or you're going to have, you're going to get hit with a fee uh, when you move out for damaging uh, over, and, uh, over and above wear and tear. Um, another important thing to notice before you sign the lease is, and people miss this all the time, is that typically a lease is going to, spend, if it's a year lease, typically it's going to say you need to notify the landlord uh, at least 30 days prior to the end of the lease that you intend to vacate if you do. Sometimes it might say that if you want to stay, you've got to give notice within that period. Um, the important thing to note, though, is to actually see what that is, because for certain properties, especially ones like on Broadway, where there is a huge amount of demand for those apartments, that notice can be 30, 60, 90, 180 days before the end of the lease. Literally, you move in six months later, you got to go, hey, landlord, I'm you know, moving out. And if you don't do that, if you don't provide that notice, you may find that the lease renews uh, either by the month or even for another full term. So if you if your lease says 180 days notice, you have to give the landlord to tell them you're going to move out or the lease renews for another year, then if you don't do that, you're in a two-year lease by that six, six month and one day period. Uh, I, back in the good old days, I generally recommended uh, that people... Um, provide that notice with whatever payment of rent that month represents. You know, you send your check as people don't really do anymore, along with a notice saying, hey, landlord, just letting you know I'm moving out at the end of this term so that he can't, he signs the check, he negotiates it, he can't prove, he can't say that he never got it. You've got ironclad proof that he received it. That doesn't quite work anymore uh, unless you do uh, have an old fashioned landlord who accepts checks. Um, so just keep bearing in mind that you have to, you know, a text is fine, an email is fine, but getting some sort of acknowledgement back for the landlord, if possible, that you gave that notice uh, would serve the same purpose. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, can you go back? I'm sorry. Uh, so um, people will often ask if you can change the locks when you move in. Landlords, for some reason, do not do that. Um, they'll just rent it, rent it to the next guy, rent it to the next guy. And, you know, unless their lock is broken or something like that, they, I mean, they just generally don't fix anything unless they have to. So you can reasonably expect that the, that the lock that you've got has probably been there for like five, 10, 15 years. Uh, can you change the lock? No. <laughs> uh, if you want to change the lock, make sure that gets written into the lease, that the landlord does it. Uh, the reason I say you can't, you can with the landlord's permission, but the landlord always has to have access to the property. Again, just in case of emergencies. So if you ch you can't just go and change the lock and not provide your landlord the keys, that's that's a breach of the lease. But uh, I'd recommend at least asking the landlord about that just to you know ensure that uh, you don't have a whole history of people who have keys to your apartment. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, so uh, we'll we'll talk a little more about the penalties for breaking the lease, but uh, that's that's something that, that kind of ties into the lease term. You have to remember that the lease is for a full period of whatever it is, a year, six months, whatever it happens to be. Uh, so if you if you do know that you're going to be moving early, um, don't sign a lease that says that it's a, for a longer term than you're going to be there because you're going to run into a problem where at the minimum, you're not getting your deposit back. The landlord may sue you because leases are what we call uh, installment contracts. And so the minute that you move out or stop paying rent, all the rent under the lease becomes immediately due and the landlord will send you a bill for the entire amount of the lease. You aren't necessarily going to pay that, but you don't you don't want to be in that position. Okay, next slide, please. All right. Um, obviously, read your lease thoroughly before signing to catch all those things and uh, and to find out anything you don't really understand. If there's something in the lease that you don't understand, it's often written in legal gobbledy gobbledygook, so that's not surprising. But ask a lawyer. Hey, I'm one, and you can always call Two Lap or email me if you want me to review your lease. I'm always thrilled to take a look at somebody's lease before there's a problem rather than uh, after the fact. Uh, make, make sure that the lease is complete. 
Um, there's a rule in Louisiana, and I would say generally, it's probably in common law jurisdictions too, that uh, the lease is considered the four corners of the agreement. And uh, what does that mean? Uh, that means that the entirety of the agreement is contained, it, the, the law between you and your landlord is contained in the lease. And so let's say that you inspect your apartment, you notice that the dishwasher has some water in the bottom and uh, it's apparently broken. Landlord says, yeah, that's fine. You're not moving in until June. That's totally cool. I'll have it fixed before then. You ask the landlord, will you write that into the lease? He goes, no, you can trust me. Well, no, you have a contract because contracts are an inherently distrustful situation. If it's not in the lease, don't expect that thing that you, that you notice to be fixed. Make sure that it's written into the lease. Leases are typically going to have special conditions or something at the end, or even if it doesn't, write it on the margin, whatever. Landlord will fix dishwasher before move-in date of 6-1-2023. You initial it, he initials it. That becomes part of the four corners of the contract. Even if it's handwritten, it's binding, and it's a breach of the lease if the landlord fails to do that. Uh, if that does not happen, there is no agreement. It does not appear in the lease. There's no agreement to that. Uh, so what else do we have? Um, Oh, so uh, this, uh, this is a little outside this topic, but uh, you as the tenant are what's considered a prudent, what the civil code says is a prudent administrator of the property. And what that means in English is that you are possessing the property and uh, the landlord is not, sometimes he is, but let's assume that he's not. Uh, and to that extent, uh, you are obligated to report to the landlord any condition you notice that is dangerous. You see an electrical problem. If the light is flickering every time you turn it on, there is water damage on the ceiling that's growing. You have to tell the landlord about that. And again, in writing. And if you do not, you are liable for any ensuing damage that results because you failed to tell it. Uh, now, kind of an extension of that is the fact that a lot of you will be signing leases uh, that say begin June 1st, just because, and you're paying rent from June, July, August, even though you're not living there, right? Because you, it's a high demand apartment and the ones like I'm talking about on Broadway are uh, are, are, are particularly, uh, are they're in high demand and the landlords can demand that it's supply and demand and that's it. So if you, you may still be back home if you're you know from out of state or from out of the country uh, for June, July, and then moving in in late August to start the semester. But you have a lease obligation that starts before that and you're paying rent before that. You're also obligated to be possessing it if the lease doesn't say otherwise, even if you know and the landlord knows that you're not there. And so this actually hasn't come up and I'm surprised it hasn't, but let's say that you sign the lease for June and then in July, the place catches fire and burns to the ground. And the landlord makes a claim with his insurance says, hey, the place burned to the ground, it was empty when it did. The, his insurance company is gonna turn around and sue you if they find out that that lease was signed with you. Why? Because you are a prudent administrator of that property. There's nothing in the lease to say that you're not there. There is something in the lease to say that you are there. So they're going to sue you and try and recoup their loss that they had to pay out to rebuild the property. I um, haven't seen it in this context, but it's certainly happened before. Um, so what I'd recommend in that case is, um, you know, it, you, you can't really have the lease start after you start paying rent. So I would just include, again, right into the lease, landlord agrees that uh, landlord agrees and understands that tenant will not be occupying the property until August 23rd, 2023, and will act as the, uh, will it recognizes the property is vacant and will take any acts to inspect something along that line doesn't have to be specific that says hey nobody's in this property until this date so it's on the landlord to check it out to the extent that um, it needs to be inspected on a periodic basis um and let's see what else and uh, oh yeah and so the uh land this comes up quite a bit uh where a uh, a lease will state that you know, the landlord has access to the property at all times for purposes of inspection, showing the property uh, or making repairs and so forth. Um, it's it's often written very broadly. Uh, sometimes it is written more narrowly. Um, I, I would generally recommend that to the extent you want to look at this and modify that, you, you don't want the landlord's agents coming through you know, on a regular basis. If he's making repairs or something like that, you don't want them tromping through and leaving mud streaks in your house and moving all your stuff when you're not there. You don't want them bursting at eight in the morning when you're getting in the shower, getting ready to go. So you might want to look at that provision and then modify it to say this, that the, to the extent that the landlord needs or his agents need access, and don't worry about the exact language if you need it, you can email me, I'll be happy to provide it. 
Um, but to the extent the land, the landlord or his agents need to access the property for purposes of showing it or for purposes of making non-emergency repairs, they will do so on weekdays between nine and five uh, after giving the tenant written notice 24 hours in advance, something like that. Um, what you can't do is say for any circumstance, right? Because again, back to emergency repairs, there's an electrical problem. You're not around. The landlord does not have to give you notice before you come in. And there's not really any way you could enforce that. So that's that's that would be the exception that you'd have to make. Uh, I think we're talking a little bit about renter's insurance. I think on one of the slides, we've seen that there's a link. I'm not going to talk too much about that, but get renter's insurance. Uh, your landlord's insurance does not cover you. Um, there will be probably something in the lease that specifically says that, even if it doesn't, it, believe me, his insurance does not cover you. Um, the landlord may be liable to you personally, individually on his own basis, but, uh, you know, depending on the circumstances, but your stuff, no, never. Your stuff has got to be covered by your own renter's insurance, or you're just going to have to take the risk. Um, uh, recording your lease, I, I realize I'm jumping around a bit here, you'll have to forgive me, uh, but recording your lease is... Um, this is, this is something you do in the event uh, that you have a lease for a term where you expect to stay the entire term and you want to make sure that that entire term will uh, be in full effect. And the way that uh, you do that is you take a copy of your lease down to uh, the land records office in, in downtown New Orleans. And again, if you need to know that, I'll provide, provide you with that information. Uh, and you 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 put it on file there. It acts as public notice for anybody who is looking to buy property that there is, hey, this is property subject to a lease. Now, what does this mean? So if you sign a lease with your landlord, that is a contract between you and your landlord. If your landlord then sells that property to another person, that person does not have a contract with you. They can put you out immediately. Now, you have a cause of action against your landlord for breaking the lease because that is a breach of the lease by the landlord. But that's cold comfort for you, for you, where you, you know, are facing down an eviction from this new landlord uh, who you have no agreement with. What recording your lease does is it gives public notice, hey, this property is bound by a lease. So if you're going to buy it, you're bound to. And so when somebody goes to buy that property, if your lease is properly recorded, you are safe. Now, what it does not protect is if you get the, and this happens quite a bit, where the landlord stops paying the, more, paying the note on the house and the bank forecloses. Uh, or he stops paying his property tax and the city expropriates it. Recording your lease does not protect you. Um, in that case, you don't really have very much protection. Uh, I'd say if that happens, there's not a lot you can do about it, except maybe, you know, if if it, I don't know. There's not a lot you can do about that ahead of time, but if it does happen, certainly talk to me and there's there are ways that we can um, that we can try to negotiate with the new landlord to keep you in. Typically, they're not going to put you out immediately, but that, that's getting a little beyond this. The, the thing I'd say you need to take away from this is that recording your lease is a great idea. Uh, it's uh, it costs about 150 bucks and it's great protection. Um, whether you think you need it or not, you never know. Okay, next slide, please. All right. Uh, th this is tying in a little bit to what we already talked about and what a couple of other people have talked about, but background to check your, your landlord and apartment. Um, uh, talk to the current tenants. Um, trust your instincts. You know, if you're talking to your landlord and let's say, for example, he's saying, I'll give you a copy of your lease. I'll send you a copy of your lease later. I'll email it to you. No, no. You want a copy of this thing that you signed right away, because if you don't have a copy of your lease, you may not have a lease because the landlord might decide to put you out and rent the place for Mardi Gras or as an Airbnb or something. And if you if there's no copy of your lease that you have in hand, you know, you're, you're you've got nothing. And so, like, if he does that, that's 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 a that's a red flag. If he says he's going to fix stuff and and say, and you say, well, can we write that in the lease? He says, well, don't you trust me? That's a red flag. Move on. You know, go go find somebody else. There's lots of landlords out there who aren't, you know, complete jerks who you can rent from and who aren't shady. And they'll, a lot of people will generally give you a pretty shady vibe right at the outset. You'll know. Uh, you know, and again, doing your homework, talking to the people who live there and Googling and finding out about your landlord and the, the property they run, the kind of business they run is always a great idea. Okay, next slide, please. Um, okay, how you can protect yourself after you sign your lease. So once you've signed the lease, you paid your deposit and your, and your rent, and you're getting ready to move in, before you move your stuff in, everybody's got a camera nowadays, right? Pictures, 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 videos. Go through the apartment, not necessarily what the people like to do, uh, especially coming from other states, they ask about uh, doing walkthroughs which I understand are pretty common. Landlords here generally don't do them. 
you can ask your landlord, but it's the 21st century. Pictures were, are worth a thousand words. I'm not that fond of, of walkthroughs anyway, and landlords generally won't do them. Pictures are great. So you document the condition of the property completely when you move in. When you're ready to move out and your stuff is out, document, again, pictures, 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 document the condition of the property when you move out. Why? Because as a tenant, you're responsible for causing damage to the property, which rises above ordinary wear and tear. You have to return it broom swept, free of trash, minus ordinary wear and tear. And other than that, you get your entire deposit back. Other people have lived in that house before you. Maybe when you moved in, there's some very gorgeous hardwood floors, but there's big scratches in the living room. Your landlord may have taken the, that might've been there for 15 years. And every time a tenant moved in and out, oh yeah, there's scratches in the living room you caused. So that's a thousand dollars off your security deposit. Well, if you have pictures of those scratches when you moved in, you can't say that. Uh, again, providing timely notice to your landlord before you move out is important. We talked about that. Um, and uh, so this is a little unorthodox and I wouldn't encourage you to do this without talking to me or another experienced lawyer beforehand, but don't, be, don't fall into the trap of thinking that it's illegal to break a lease if you need to break a lease. If you have a sick relative and you need to go home, you need to withdraw from Tulane for whatever reason, you, you feel that the neighborhood is unsafe. You know, you have no valid reason to break your lease because you're the, 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 you know, it's not an act of or neglect by your landlord, but it's your gunfire every night. You made the wrong choice you're in the wrong place. Don't compromise your safety because you have a contract. Contracts are meant to be broken. That happens all the time. The civil code accounts for it. If there are procedures for it and there's ways to do it, Again, you don't want to do it without talking to a lawyer, but don't feel like you have to stay in a place where you feel unsafe or where you feel you can no longer be because you have a contract. Talk to a lawyer, see what you can do to get out of it, either by negotiating with your landlord or by simply going and uh, taking certain steps to make sure that you're protected. Um, okay, I, you can uh, move on to the next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, yeah, we talked about getting a signed copy of your lease. Um, make sure that everybody signs the lease. Uh, the, the, there is, we're gonna, there's a rule in Louisiana called the, uh, the, the tenants are what are called joint obligors. So if you are all, let's say there are five of you living in a house and three of you sign the lease and two don't, well, only those three people who sign the lease have an agreement that is reflected by the lease to the landlord. All of you, have an agreement among each other, uh, arguably, <laughs> to complete all terms of the lease because of it, uh, you know, the informality of living together creates that. Um, but uh, when you are joint obligor under a lease, let's say that you're the only responsible one and your other four roommates flake out, your rent is $5,000 a year for everybody to live there and all, the, all your roommates kind of pick up and move out. Your landlord is not going to go chasing down those four people to get the rent. He's going to come to you and say, where's my $5,000? Uh, similarly, uh, let's say that uh, everybody moves out and flakes out and they throw a big party and destroy the place, and then you're the only one left uh, at the end of the lease term, and uh, 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 you didn't cause any of the damage. Well, that damage, whatever it is, is attribu attributable to you. All obligations under the lease can be enforced against any one person. That's what that means. Um, it's important to be aware of that, and it kind of ties back into making sure that you know who your roommates are and that you trust them and that these are people who you want to do business with because uh, this is a uh, business arrangement. Um, let's see. Uh, we There are certain provisions in the lease that you might have concerns about. Um, people often raise concern about the fact that an, an, a lease will say that, um, you know, th that there's a unilateral tenant pays the attorney's fees of the landlord in the event of a uh, dispute that goes to court, something along those lines. Um, I, I don't like it. I prefer that if there's, you know, there are no attorney's fees, generally speaking, unless it's provided by statute or by contract. Um, so if the contract says that the landlord gets attorney's fees, if you break your lease, the landlord gets attorney's fees if you break your lease. I would prefer personally that leases uh, would were bilateral, or if there's any attorney's fees provision at all, that it's bilateral, either loser pays, we'd say, right? No lease says that. <laughs> uh, I, I'd say like probably, you know, most, most leases are from uh, the real estate commission. Uh, all of those leases provide unilateral tenant pays, landlords, attorney's fees. Most leases provide that. Um, if you are going to try to find a lease that doesn't say that, good luck. 
Um, you could try to get your landlord to negotiate it out of it. I would encourage you to do it. Don't expect him to do it. And I wouldn't say walk away if that's a deal breaker for you because it shouldn't be because you're probably not going to find one that does say that. Um, what There are red flags, though. And the two that I could think of right off the top of my head are that, um, and this is going to sound hard to believe, but it, it, there are provisions that say this, that in the, even in the event of, uh, you know, obviously that if a tenant is neglectful, then he's liable to the landlord for any damages to the property, as we talked about. Uh, there are provisions in the lease that'll say that if there is neglect that is due to the fault of the lessor, the tenant is responsible. We'll pay the tenant, we'll pay the landlord's attorney's fees and any damages for the landlord's own neglect. Do not sign that. Um, I have never seen it tested in court. Um, I would expect that if a judge saw that, they would find that it was unconscionable, unconscionable and void against public policy. I wouldn't want to test that. Uh, if you see that in the lease, ask the landlord to modify it. Say, hey, I'm responsible. I'm fine being responsible for my own neglect, but I don't think it's fair that I'm responsible for yours. Um, and uh, the uh, the other one that uh, that I that I found uh, that you and this is again maybe a deal breaker, maybe not. It kind of depends on where you're at. Uh, a lot of the places that are in super high demand on Broadway uh, that are you know I would say like our quasi fraternity houses. Uh, uh, will have this, but uh, naming uh, naming other people as as uh, guarantors, right? And so that means they, they, these are landlords who understand there's a lot of money at stake. The rent is fifteen thousand dollars a month or something, and uh, for a large house with a lot of tenants, and there's a lot can go wrong. And so since you all, as students, most of you as students, don't have a lot of property, don't have anything to take, don't have salaries yet, they have your parents sign on as 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 guarantors, meaning that even though they're not living in the house, they're guaranteeing. All obligations under the lease. And obviously that gives the landlord a much bigger incentive to sue if something does go wrong. Generally speaking, I'm a landlord. I only own property. It's not around Tulane. Uh, you know, but most landlords, including me, if somebody breaks the lease and they move out, you move on. It's the cost of doing business. You don't go around suing everybody who breaks a lease. But if you got a guarantor on the hook, that changes the calculation. And so if you see that, what will often happen is the landlord often won't even realize that that's there. Um, just ignore it. Um, don't sign it. Don't have your parents sign it. Do not voluntarily. Don't. Hey, mom, sign this. If the landlord is insistent on it, really try to push back and make and and say, look, I'm. We're just not comfortable signing that. That's kind of a deal breaker. Um, unless you got to have that place. Um, I, you know, I'd say I'd say look elsewhere. Um, Gregory. Um, yes. I just to be mindful of time, we still have two more presenters. Oh, okay. I, I think yeah. that's most of what I've got. Uh, okay. Can we see with the next slide? Just make sure I didn't. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. there's a couple of important things here. Uh, yeah. Just you know, if you're if you're if you're renting from abroad, uh, there there are landlords who are aware that you are, or even out of state, uh, there are landlords who are aware uh, of and and go directly towards uh, trying to uh, uh, rent to people who are who are coming from out of state or from another country because they know once you leave New Orleans you're probably not going to come back to go to court and they try to take your security deposit. Um, come to two lap if that happens to you. Um, there's not a, really a lot you can do on the front end, but one thing you can do is you can find someone in Louisiana who can either uh, go who can who can file the lawsuit for you. You can assign your rights to them. Um, they can. Uh, or you know you can come to two lap and have us write a, a letter to the landlord like saying hey I got a lawyer here in New Orleans and so you better give the deposit back uh, that that should uh, that 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 should take care of the problem in most cases and I think that was it I, I don't know if there are any other slides great no I think that's it so we'll turn it over to Donald or no Jennifer yep Jennifer. this one's me. Okay. <laughs> just, just me on this. Quick one. This, in, this in the this in the next uh, set. So um, okay, but it won't take too long. Um, setting up utilities. This is another of those where um, the links in this are going to be way more useful than practically anything I'm going to say right now. Um, but once you're at the point of moving in and you figured out what utilities you are responsible for, this is a list of the uh, various companies you may need to reach out to. Um, as always, verify what's in your lease, um, what services you need. Um, does your rental have gas and electric or just electric? That's I've lived in places with both. Um, are any utilities included in your lease, um, such as water and waste removal or internet? Um, 
in my personal experience, water and waste removal are often included, um, but uh, most other utilities tend to be uh, the renter's responsibility. And just to be clear, since many people watching this may not be familiar with the greater New Orleans area, um, Metairie is actually in Jefferson Parish, uh, which is just west of the city proper. St. Bernard Parish is just east of the city. And it would be a little out of the way unless you're based at the downtown campus. Uh, next slide, please. All right, public transportation and biking. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about getting around campus and the city. These are all resources I have used routinely and I hope that you will too. These days, I mostly have to drive to campus and between the road work, the traffic, the parking restrictions um, and everything else, I dream of being able to bike and use transit more often again. And I was just reminded that I should have explained um, that in Louisiana, just in case you're not familiar, we have parishes as our kind of land uh, divisions um, as opposed to counties. They're almost interchangeable. Um, we are in Orleans Parish, emphasis on the E there uh, versus New Orleans. So um, that's, that's where you'll find us. Um, but anyways, yes, transit. Um, so shuttles. Um, Tulane provides a number of options to get between our campuses and around our neighborhoods. All of this information is best accessed at shuttles.tulane.edu. Schedules and routes may change, so we highly recommend that you keep an eye on that website. The backbone of the system is the fixed shuttle service. The two green lines collectively run about it every 30 minutes on weekdays between the uptown and downtown campuses. The routes are pretty similar. Um, there's just a different drop off um, on the uptown campus. The red line runs on the weekends uh, about once an hour to accommodate those of you who need to get to campus on weekends. When riding a shuttle, all riders must present their Tulane ID card. This does mean that non-affiliates such as students, partners um, are not able to ride the shuttle. TapRide, as has been mentioned a few times before, is a pretty cool system uh, that serves the neighborhoods around Tulane's uptown campus. So it provides on-demand rides to students from points on campus to points within approximately a mile of campus, uh, which could be cars, residences, anything like that. Um, and finally, I didn't note it here, but if you're coming to New Orleans and need a rental car as you're finding um, your housing, uh, Tulane has rental car agreements with Enterprise and more information about that is also available on the shuttle site. All right, so pictured here is one of the St. Charles line streetcars, which run from Canal Street all the way down St. Charles Avenue and part of the way up Carrollton Avenue. We have a stop just outside Gibson Hall on the uptown campus and a number of our downtown buildings are fairly close to the route. As a side note, uh, part of the historic charm of the St. Charles streetcar is its historic lack of air conditioning. Streetcars also run on Canal Street and through downtown and those do have air conditioning. Um, they don't tend to follow much of a schedule. Uh, the process of paying at the point of boarding slows everything down. Um, they kind of travel in packs because of that. So I always like to check the streetcar tracker on um, RTA's website, the New Orleans Regional Transit um, Authority's website, or uh, live arrivals on RTA's website to see how far away the streetcar was if I was taking it, um, using it to get to work. Um, they're slightly less picturesque, but RTA also runs an extensive bus network with stops around our campuses and two ferries. Uh, to the West Bank of the Mississippi River. While you can pay with cash, as I was alluding, um, in person or via RTA's La Pass app, you can also buy transit passes in campus services at Tulane. Biking. Um, bicycling is an important element of uh, the New Orleans transportation network. New Orleans is a fairly flat city. There are some benefits of being below sea level as the person who was just talking about flooding, um, but it does make biking easier. Uh, there are currently over 100 miles of dedicated on-street bike lanes, um, designated share the road lanes and off-street multi-use paths in New Orleans. 
This map here is from Bike Easy, uh, a nonprofit organization that is devoted to making bicycling a bigger part of New Orleanians' daily lives. And they have a lot of great resources. They're also linked here. Um, as you travel to and from campus and across New Orleans by bike, make sure that you stay, stay safe by following these rules. One, you need to obey all traffic laws. Um, in Louisiana, bicycles are considered vehicles and must obey the rules of the road. This includes coming to a complete stop at stop signs and stoplights. Two, ride on the road. In New Orleans, bicyclists over the age of 14 must ride on the road, not on the sidewalks. Our sidewalks, frankly, have a lot of tree root damage in many places, so it is really easier to ride in the street. Three, ride in the direction of traffic. Louisiana law requires bicyclists to ride in the direction of traffic and as near to the right side of the road as practicable. Four, use lights at night. Cyclists are required to use lights and reflectors at night, white for the front, red for the back. Five, wear a helmet. We love your brain. We accepted you for it. Please protect it. Six, when you're on campus or really anywhere around, bicyclists should always lock their bike in designated bike racks when not in use. Please don't lock your bike to a tree, fencing, ADA ramps, handrails, or lamp posts. To mitigate thefts, all bicyclists are encouraged to use U-locks, which are more secure and they're more difficult to cut than cable locks. So for more information, um, please check out Bike Easy's website, the Bicycle Security and Safety page, TUPD's website, and Louisiana's Bicycle Law site. Thanks, Jennifer. Now we're going to turn it over to Donald to talk to us about how to prepare yourself for a hurricane. Hey, everybody. I'm going to get us through this as quickly as possible. Can you go to the next slide? I did this as part of my introduction. Um, go to the next slide. All right, so if there is an emergency, we have a system called Everbridge. With Everbridge, we're able to email you, text you, call you. And also with our two-lane computers, um, we have a software called Alertus. And what Alertus does, it actually sends an emergency alert to Tulane University computers to their desktop. So just in case you're in the classroom um, and the professor is talking and your phone is on silent, Although your phone is on silence, your, um, that emergency message will pop up on the display in the classroom. We also have blue light sirens and poles throughout our uptown and downtown campus. So as you all are walking around campus, you'll notice um, either poles, um, tall green poles with blue lights. Some have cameras, some don't, but all of them do have a call box. If you press that call box button, you'll be in contact with one of our Tulane Police Department dispatchers. Also, with our emergency notification, can okay, go back one more time? Um, definitely follow us on our social media um, at Tulane Emergency Facebook and really Instagram. To the top right hand corner, you'll see Tulane University TU Alert. Anytime you receive a text message that says TU Alert, definitely stop what you're doing, read that um, message because that is us notifying you of, a, um, of an emergency. Next slide, Kat. Um, so with Everbridge, what Everbridge does, we have an Everbridge app. With Everbridge, we're able to, um, there's additional resources. So with Everbridge, there's a section that's called Safe Corridor. With Safe Corridor, you could utilize that as you're walking around campus at night. So say, for example, you don't want Captain Dominguez holding your hand as you're walking from point A to point B. You could just go to your Everbridge app <clears throat> um, and use the Safe Corridor feature. Um, also, I have Tulane Police Department number programmed in the app. And then last but not least, there's a SOS function on the app as well, too. Once you press that red button on the app, um, it's going to alert Tulane Police Department, including the police chief, the command staff, the supervisors on duty, um, myself, and the dispatchers. And the message that we will receive is your name, your telephone number, and your GPS location. Your GPS location is going to pop up just like a Google Earth map. Um, go back, going the wrong way. There you go. Um, it's going to pop up like a Google Earth map. Um, so it's going to show what building you're in, but it's not going to show what location you're actually in. So definitely download the Everbridge app. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, hurricane evacuation. So with hurricane evacuation, it is required for all students to um, um, submit their evacuation plan, whether you, whether you live off campus or on campus. So if you um, scan that QR code, you will need your um, Tulane credentials to log in to create your plan. And just remember, you can um, change your plan at any time. So just remember, your plan is your primary plan. If you're going to evacuate with Tulane University, that has to be your last option. I also added a link for our evacuation policy that just took effect um, in August. So remember, you have to have your own plan first. Next slide. Um, so hurricane season is June 1st through November 30th. So currently we are in hurricane season right now. Um, normally seven days out, we see it coming, but that's more for a Atlantic formation. Um, five days out, we're going to know if it's coming towards us. Um, something that we've been noticing for the past three years for hurricanes, um, they've been um, they've been formed in and around the Gulf of Mexico. So that seven days out can actually be cut in half, depending on the strength and intensity of that hurricane. <clears throat> Some hurricane hazards are high winds, storm surge, and heavy rainfall and inland flooding. Um, New Orleans does flood a lot. Um, I believe we are um, eight feet below sea level. Um, a few years ago, we actually had a rain event where um, around 12 to 15 inches of rain fell within two hours and flooded our uptown and downtown campus. So also with hurricane impacts, you may run into power outages, um, loss of um, infrastructure like internet. We may enact a boil water advisory because pumping stations are overloaded or they, or they um, probably have, have gone down. Also fuel, fuel shortages as well too. So just remember, um, everyone has their cell phone, just have a portable um, battery charger with you to ensure that your cell phone is always charged. Next slide. Um, so what will Tulane do? Uh, we're gonna do either three things. We're gonna close and shelter in place, basically means we're gonna house our students on campus. We're gonna close and evacuate, or we may not just do nothing because the storm's not gonna impact us. Um, so just remember, if we shelter in place, close and evacuate, one of the things that you should always take with you is take your books with you because during COVID, we become we became experts at um, conducting Zoom classes. So always have those items with you. Um, and just remember our off-campus students, um, our shelter in place are only for our on-campus students. Um, once again, read that evacuation policy. Um, next slide, please. Um, we already touched on this. Um, next slide, please. We already talked about submitting a personal evacuation plan. There you go. Things to consider. Where will you go? If you do have to evacuate, think about well, where you're going to evacuate to. When will you make that decision to leave? How will you travel out of the city? Things like rail and bus. If the city of New Orleans um, um, starts a um, uh, mandatory evacuation, they will utilize the rail and um, RTA buses to evacuate city residents. Um, think about your um, out-of-town designated contact. You want to let your out-of-town contacts know that you are traveling or just let a friend or family member know where your um, evacuation point is going to be. We always recommending if we do have to evacuate going 250 to 300 miles north or away from the storm. If that storm follow you 250 to 300 miles inland, by the time it gets to you, it's going to be rain and not hurricane force winds. And always think about your pets as well, too. You have to have a plan for your pets. Next slide. Other things to keep with you, um, medication, toiletries, important documentation. Um, Captain Dominguez touched on it. Have that fireproof box with you. Um, if there is an evacuation, I'm going to be here. But my family has a uh, fireproof file um, um, box that has all of our important documentation in it so my wife could just grab and go. Other essentials, cash, battery chargers, multi-tool, can openers, battery operated um, radios, cell phone with charger. And also think about your pets and your infants too. You wanna have supplies for them as well. Next slide. Form action, one thing we will do, we will always communicate with you. So pay attention to our um, emails and text messages that will come through. Um, after the storm passed, do not try and come on campus. Campus will be closed until our disaster assessment team um, confirms that it is clear for folks to arrive back on campus. And we will send that communication out via Everbridge. But well, once again, always be prepared to um, work remote on Zoom for your classes. Next slide. 
Once again, contact us. I know I went pretty quick, but I have a hard email address. It's donald at tulane.edu. Definitely email me whatever questions you may have. Thank you again, everyone. Thanks, Donald. Uh, Chris, you are up next. All right. So thanks, thanks for you. hanging in it, with us. <laughs> I'm going to bring us home talking about our expectations for all of our students and their guests to be good neighbors, regardless of whether they live in the community or they live on campus and are visiting our local neighborhoods. There are many diverse neighborhoods within New Orleans, and we hope that you get to explore so many of them to learn about the rich culture and the history uh, that makes New Orleans so great and, and Tulane's special place in that. But in order for Tulane to be a good partner with New Orleans, we expect our students to be good neighbors and good ambassadors, good representatives of Tulane. And so we've outlined a series of expectations that will help students, their guests, their families uh, be part of that good neighbor expectation that we have. Next slide. <clears throat> because your experience living in a residence hall, which most of our first and second year undergraduate students will live on residence halls, but the vast majority of our other students, our juniors and seniors, our graduate and professional students live off campus. Um, so a lot of our expectations in this that are, are, are geared towards those students that are living off campus in our neighborhoods. So we want you to be respectful of the communities because adults are living there, professionals are living there, faculty and staff from the university are living there, they're living and they're going to work. Um, and so they want to live in a place that is, that is peaceful, um, that is, again, surrounded by those individuals representing Tulane that are going to contribute in a positive way to those, um, those neighborhoods. Uh, next slide. And so the first set of expectations that we expect all of our, our Tulane students and their guests to abide by are outlined in our code of student conduct. And so students are governed by the tenets of that code of student conduct, whether they're on campus or off campus, whether they're full-time, part-time, undergraduate, graduate, professional students, online, it doesn't matter. The code applies in all locations. The code applies also at all times, even during breaks. We're currently on summer semester, so most of our students are not enrolled. However, the code still applies during periods of summer. And so all students are expected to know, to understand, and to abide by the tenets of that code. The code is available publicly. Anyone can view our code at conduct.tulane.edu, uh, looking for our behavioral expectations outlined in our code of student conduct. Uh, next slide. A few things that I want to highlight where there is some overlap between the code and the legal expectations. Uh, the first one is the noise ordinance. I won't read the whole slide, but you can see that un, you know, just like every other city, there are some noise uh, ordinance expectations. The level of volume of music, of, of conversation, uh, it is a pretty a lower threshold than people often think. And so violating the noise ordinance is not unusual um, with things like projected music, whether it's from a car, whether it's from uh, speakers aimed out a window or the level of noise coming from a large crowd. And our Tulane Police Department will regularly either be called out or will be patrolling the areas um, with decibel readers. We have some at the university that students can borrow as well to make sure that their regular activity is within the noise ordinance, uh, the decibel levels. So again, make sure that you're aware of the decibel levels depending on the day of the week, the time um, of, of the day, as well as those decibel levels may, may shift. Uh, next slide. And then similarly, <clears throat> living off campus, whether even it's for us, those of us that live um, in New Orleans because we work at Tulane, the city has expectations and laws that govern trash collection. And so making sure that you as, as a neighbor, that you understand when trash, your trash days are, you're putting the trash out the evening before. And as soon as the trash is picked up, you're, you're putting it back in its storage space, whether that's in the driveway or in a shed or alongside the house or in the backyard, but it can't stay on the sidewalk and it can't be dr uh, blocking driveways and it can't be blocking sidewalks or other means of aggress. Uh, and then they have to be contained within the containers themselves. Uh, so trash can't be spilling out or piled up around the trash cans um, or for large trash, like again, furniture or mattresses. 
If they don't fit in those cans, they will not be picked up unless you specifically call and place an order via 311 for those bulk trash pickups. And so we have resources on our campus, some ways to remind you, uh, again, to be able to, to make those reservations, to pick those up, and those expectations about the bulk um, pickup. Next slide. And again, similarly, um, here is a schedule of your curbside recycling and, and trash pickup. Uh, there are some limitations to what things are picked up, uh, including recycling. Uh, at this time, recycling pickup in the city does not include uh, certain things like glass. There are recycling centers in which students can, can recycle some of those things that can't be picked up that traditionally can be recycled. So again, we ask that you please refer to some of these resources so that you know what can be, what is considered trash, what is considered recycling, um, and what would be considered a bulk pickup and how to dispose of all of those things properly so that you're not getting citations from the city and that you're not getting a letter from the Office of Student Conduct indicating that you've been in violation of our behavioral expectations. Next slide. And then these are some helpful reminders on how to be a good neighbor. Uh, <clears throat> parking your, your vehicles in a legal way. You can't park on sidewalks or in yards or parking blocking uh, fire extinguishers or, or handicap accessible ramps. So making sure that you are honoring uh, regular parking regulations. Uh, it's a good idea to introduce yourself to your neighbors. I think that's been said before. Um, again, starting that respectful and polite uh, dialogue can be really helpful so that if there are problems, maybe they'll call you before they call the police and you can resolve it really amicably. And so maybe it's helpful to swap uh, contact information, you looking out for their property, them looking out for your property is good for everybody. Um, if you do plan on leaving, for instance, letting them know is a good idea. Just like if you plan on having a, a party or a gathering, making sure that you're letting them know, asking them to contact you if there are problems before calling the police. Uh, that's only in, in your best interest. Uh, again, if there's damage or, or other dangers, make sure that you're contacting 311, or if it's an immediate eminent threat danger that you're contacting either Tulane police or NOPD, depending on your location. But again, our, our expectation is that you're following all New Orleans code uh, laws, as well as the code of student conduct yeah. at all times in the neighborhood. And then we have a series of resources that we've put together for you uh, related to our behavioral expectations and some support services that can help make sure that you're staying within those, those guidelines. And Kat, that is my time. Thank you, Chris. Um, for folks who wanna stick around, I think we have four questions in the chat. And as I said at the beginning, if you, any questions that come up or that weren't answered, just please email them to offcampushousing at tulane.edu. So Catherine, I'll, I'll take a couple of the questions then and um, pose those to the panelists. Sure. So, um, so Greg, is two lap closed during the summer since it is between spring and fall semester? Um, so yes, in that, uh, so two laps run by students and obviously they, you know, go to the four corners of the earth during summer. Um, so the pro we're not taking appointments, uh, during the summer, we're not writing demand letters and so forth. And obviously that can be a little inconvenient if, um, people want leases reviewed or have a, an issue that comes up before they move in, but that's fine. You can just email me directly. Uh, Catherine, I'm, uh, anybody who wants to have my email address, if they don't already have it please provide it and I'll be happy to answer any questions, review a lease uh, or do whatever on my own, uh, you know, before we reopen uh, next fall. Okay, thank you, Greg. Um, for the person who asked about um, what's considered a personal evacuation plan, I put in the chat that there's much more detail about what to include and how to kind of formulate your plan and things to consider on the emergency preparedness um, website. So you'll be able to see more detail if you, once you um, dive into that particular website. Um, and when Catherine posts this, rec the recording of the webinar and the PDF of the slides, you'll be able to open all of those um, different resources that are linked in the, in the slides that you see. Um, another person um, asked, 
about the tap ride service and if it will, you know, what the time periods are for that. So on the shuttles and transportation website, the schedules for each term are up. If you um, have a more detailed question, the, I, the email address for that department is also on that website. So, um, and those, some, sometimes those time periods change from semester to semester. Um, another person asked that since they're an international student, they wanted to know what the process to sign a contract is once they've chosen an apartment, what information do you need to provide? Greg, is that something you think you can answer? Um, more or less. Uh, so it, it's, it's gonna depend. Um, some landlords, you know, I guess you know, like smaller mom and pop businesses, they may just, they may ask nothing. Um, they may do a quick rental application, just asking for previous rental history. Uh, if you're an international student, you probably don't have that. Um, you may not have a social security number. So, you know, there might not be, a, there, you may not be able to do a background check. Larger corporate landlords are probably going to require that kind of stuff. Honestly, I'm not sure to the extent if you're an international student, uh, uh, that, you know, say a River Lake Properties or a company that does require like a full-blown rental application handles that. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't think that, I don't think, I guess I'd, I guess you can, I can say that you don't really, I, I haven't heard of anybody encountering a problem in that regard. Justin? Do yeah, you I'm not sure if that answers the question in terms of signing a contract, though. Okay. Justin, do you have any um, experience with students needing particular kinds of ID or needing to get that social security number before they could finalize everything about a rental agreement? Uh, sometimes just your passport and a copy of your immigration document would be sufficient. Uh, again, just to kind of echo um, what uh, Gregory was just talking about, it is gonna kind of depend um, what each landlord uh, might require in terms of documentation. Uh, you can't get a social security number unless you have uh, some sort of uh, employment um, so you can't use that as a way to um, verify your identity when you're applying for an apartment. I'll, I'll add, I don't think that you're going to have any problem whether you had whether or not you have a social security number uh, renting from any landlord. They all want your money. And so they'll find a way. And then one person asked if um, if they are coming with a spouse and two children, would a studio apartment be okay? I think you're going to have to just um, carefully look at the dimensions and how it is composed or laid out. Some something may be considered a studio apartment. Usually, if it's more like everything is in one room or one room and a bath, um, so it might be that the kitchen area is really part of one big room that you also use for your, you know, your bedroom and living space. So I think if you are considering one, then ask if you can, if they can send you a floor plan with the dimensions, and then you can compare that to what you're used to living in um, to see whether or not you think it's going to be spacious enough for you. So, you know, somebody might create a studio apartment out of a really small space in a big house that's been divided, you know, an older house that's been divided into multiple units, and then something that is like a more modern or newer built apartment building that has a a variety of apartment types like studios, one bedroom, two bedroom, you know, those might be laid out differently and the spaces might vary greatly. So um, just, just carefully, you know, consider and review the way it is designed. So I think that that was all of the questions. So I'll turn things back over to Catherine. Great, thanks, Penny. Well, thank you everybody who hung around for the extra time. Um, we really appreciate you attending this webinar. As I said, all questions or concerns or comments, email to offcampushousing at tulane.edu. That goes directly to me. And so I can either answer the questions or connect you with the appropriate person. Um, and I'd like to thank all of our panelists. They did a great job. And we look forward to seeing you when you arrive on campus. Have a great rest of your day.